Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Welcome back, everybody. (laughs) So happy to be here with you as we tie in and tie together our series on imaginals and scripts. Today, we have the amazing Dr. John Grayson, and he is going to talk about acceptance scripts and the real importance of making sure we use acceptance when we're talking about scripts and imaginals. And I'm so excited to share this episode with you. I think it really does, again, tie together the two other guests that we've had on the show in this series. So for those of you who are listening to this and haven't listened to the other two episodes of the series, go back two weeks. We've got the first one with Krista Reed, and she's talking about scripts and the way she uses them. Then we have Sharla Nicely, and she talks about her own specific way of using scripts. And again, the reason that I didn't just have one person and leave it at that is I do think For each person, we have to find specific ways in which we do these skills and tools so we can make it specific to your obsessions and your intrusive thoughts. One explanation or one version or variety of this is probably not enough. And I want to really deep dive in this series so that you feel like Number one, you have a good understanding of what an imaginal and a script is. Number two, you know how to use them. You know the little nuanced pieces of information that you need to sort of help make sure OCD and your OCD related disorder doesn't make it a compulsion because it can. And I really wanted to get some groundwork so that you feel confident using imaginals and scripts in your own treatment and your own recovery. Again, for those of you who are a little lost and feel like you need a better understanding of OCD, of how OCD works, how it keeps you stuck, the cycle of OCD, and you want to make up your own individual OCD and ERP plan, you can go to cbtschool.com. We have a full seven-hour course that will walk you through exactly how I do it with my patients. And you can do that at your own pace. It's an on-demand course. It is not therapy, but it will help you if you don't have access to therapy or if you're really just wanting to understand and do a deep dive and understand what ERP is and how you can use it. So that is there for you. But if you are someone who is just wanting to get to the good stuff, let's go over to the episode with Dr. John Grayson. Thank you, Dr. John Grayson, for coming on the show again. Always a pleasure to have such amazing people who really know their stuff. So I'll enjoy this episode with you. Let's go. Welcome, Dr. John Grayson. I'm so happy to have you back. It is always fun to be with you. Okay, so it's funny that you're number three, because I probably need you to be number one. Almost all of the scripting I ever learned was from your book. I think that even Sharla Nicely came on and spoke about how a lot of what she does is through your book as well. And so let's just talk about the way in which you walk people through an imaginal or a script. Now, do you call it imaginal script? Do you think they're synonymous? Do you have a different way of explaining it? I think jargon wise, they're synonymous. Mm-hmm. You know, I think by definition, but, but I, you know, I feel weird saying that by definition because we made it up. I came up with the name script because originally imaginal exposure suggested I'm just dealing with all the horrors and person's just going to think about it. I changed the name to script because I was including both what are you being exposed to? what might happen, and why would you take this risk? Because I feel like the script is not only to get used to the material, but we kind of remind the person, 
why am I doing this? What am I getting out of taking this horrible risk? Why would I want to live with that? So integral to the script is the whole idea of I am also learning acceptance. Because I think too often, I, I think the biggest problem I see in most therapists is they just jump into doing exposure without making sure the person has done level one acceptance, which is I want to live with uncertainty. Because to say I want to live with uncertainty is to say, I am willing to cope if the worst things happen. You know, so it's not just this general idea. It's like going to the extreme. I'm willing to live even if this happens. I'm willing to drive a car knowing that I might get maimed, paralyzed, and disfigured in a car crash. I think that's acceptance because if you're telling me you're never going to crash in a car and you know that's true, I guess that's a nice comforting thought that might you might be in for a shock. So, right, we're willing to take that risk. And so I think across the board, it's always willing to live with the worst possible. So scripts kind of try to encapsulate that, you know, trying to help bring the person not only to confront their fear, but to remind them of all the ways they want to cope with it. And it is not a reassurance thing, because let's face it, the worst thing happening, saying I'll cope with the worst is not really reassuring in a sense, because it's something you really don't want to happen. But I guess the goal is, first of all, if it happens, you will do something that's coping or not. And, um, and I think non-acceptance, God bless you. Uh, I'm glad, I'm glad we're, I'm glad we're live so people can see you were sneezing as opposed to I just didn't go into religious ecstasy. <laughs> um, I, I think we see non-acceptance insidiously all over the place without realizing it. In the beginning of the pandemic, so many people were going like, well, this can't last all summer. I, I can't deal with that. That is a statement of avoidance and non-acceptance. You know, I was listening to that, and in the back of my mind, it's like, let's see, everything they've told us makes it seem like this is going on for two years because they're not finding a vaccine. And seriously, you're not going to, like, what, you know, you're, you can't take it, you're not going to do it? Like, what are you going to do? And in retrospect, everybody would have to admit, well, yeah, it, it was not fun, it was awful, but I lived through it. So acceptance would have been, well, how am I going to try to make the best of this? Making the best of it isn't like wonderful, which I guess brings us to the first point about acceptance. Because you know, I think in Western world, we make everything glossy and pretty and beautiful. You know, and acceptance is just this wonderful land of Zen happiness. You know, it's like I'm accepting everything is so good. And in reality, the best way to describe acceptance is that it sucks in the short run. In the short run, acceptance means I'm going to be willing to embrace what seems to me the second best life. This is what I want. Can have it. I will, I will embrace this, you know, and, and we'll keep talking more. But one prime reason to do acceptance is you don't have a choice. The, world, the other world doesn't exist. Yeah. In the beginning of the pandemic, Kathy and I were doing our pandemic walk. My wife, Kathy, we were doing our pandemic walk. I remember as you're terrified of everybody and you're walking, looking around. And Kathy says to me, God, this would be such a great day if all this wasn't happening. And I said to her, you're wrong, Kathy, which for all the listeners should immediately cue them into the idea being married to a psychologist is not necessarily fun. <laughs> I said to her, it is a beautiful day. We're with each other. Here we are. We're holding hands, taking a walk. It's really pretty. We're going to be spending the whole day together. The truth is, it is a great day. And it's horrible that all of this is happening. So I think acceptance is always and. Yeah. And, you know, we always talk about letting stuff be there as if it's very passively like, oh, you know, I can just let it be there, not bother me. No, it's really horrible. And uh, a, a client let me tell this really horrible story, which I can't remember if I've told on here, but it's a more graphic description of what acceptance looks like, if I may. Young girl came to, was brought to me, 17, was really in terrible shape. I mean, she had been hospitalized, she had suicide attempts, so anxious she couldn't tolerate being in a counselor's office for more than one hour at when she first came in. Her meds were a mess. 
Over the next three months, we got her meds in line, and she really worked incredibly hard considering where she was. And in, in December, they asked, could she be in my support group? And I said, well, it's not really for kids. And they talked me into saying, we think she's mature. First of all, whenever she spoke up in group, whatever she say would be brilliantly insightful that would just knock everybody out. She did not look old, but nobody could believe she was only 17. And as the year went on, we were tapering off sessions. And uh, the last time I saw her in June, her parents, her and her brother, they were driving out to the uh, desert outside of L.A. looking for like a you know vacation getaway place. And on their way there, a drunk driver in her third DUI rammed the car and killed my patient, Ruby, and her 14-year-old brother. I don't have to tell you how devastated the parents were. And I could talk a lot of stories that are amazing about them because I, I saw them starting about three weeks after their loss, you know, at which point they said, we want to be more than the parents of dead kids, but we can't imagine anything else. And I said, well, I can, I can tell you what treatment will be like, but it just seems like words. And they agreed it'll be just words, but it's just nice to hear there's something. They coped amazingly well, but the only good thing about coping in this case is it's better than not coping. And maybe that's true a lot of the time. And after a year and a half, they did buy the place where they were going to, where they, that they were looking for that day. And they bought it because it made them feel closer to the kids. They didn't push that away at all. And every year and a half, they were at the place, and there was one night where there was a meteor shower. They thought, let's, oh, we're going to go out and watch the meteor shower. And they go out at midnight, lay down on their backs, and both immediately burst into tears. Because this 17-year-old and 14-year-old were actually the kind of kids they would have happily gone out there with their parents and enjoyed the whole time. And I said to the dad, was it a pretty meteor shower? I said, yeah. Are you sorry you saw it? No. And I said, the truth, it was a beautiful meteor shower, and it's horrible that your kids were murdered. And it's kind of a dark sense of humor. And said, well, I thought we'd have at least a few moments. And I said, yeah, that wasn't happening. That's acceptance. You know, they, they were living in the present. They could enjoy things. And there was a hole in their heart. And the alternative to that is comparing life to every second of life to how much better it would be. And whenever I compare life to a fantasy, I ruin the present. I have nothing. So I think the reason for acceptance is to make the best of whatever we can have. You know, I think, I think one of the wonderful things sometimes is that a lot of what we avoid is not something so devastating. So it's maybe more in our head what we're trying to avoid. But... <sighs> A low probability event is not a no probability event. And so if that's what I'm scared of, low odds are uncomforting because I want no odds. Am I answering your question? No, you are. I think it's a really great opportunity for us to sort of segue. So you've talked about the first step being to familiarize yourself with uncertainty before doing scripts and acceptance, right? Can you now that you've sort of beautifully explained this idea and, and for the listeners, you can also go back, you know, Dr. Grayson has been on the show before you can listen to, we've talked a lot about that, which is so beautiful. And I think very much complements what you're saying. Let's talk about the script of that you're speaking of. So once you've done that work of acceptance, how would you, of, of, of I'm just, you know, I may have to call you Ms. Quinlan since you referred to no, Ms. Dr. Call Grayson. Me <laughs> you know. <laughs> call me John. <laughs> I mean, that first step, are you willing to learn to live with uncertainty? That step is variable of talking and therapy for the first session to, I've had some people take three months before they agree. Like, it's not like I really have a choice. And yeah. that's really kind of what we're getting. Like, you know, what, what are you losing to that? And I can't remember if I just said this before, but you know, one of my biggest thing that I end up uh, teaching therapists who have been around the field for years is do not start exposure until the person has actually agreed that they're willing to learn to do this. And the first, you know, because obviously they can just accept uncertainty, then we're done session one. 
So it takes one, one session to three months. And the, the loose measure is to, cause to accept uncertainty is to say, if the worst happens, I will try to live with it and I will try to cope with it. So if somebody says to me, if that happens, I'll kill myself. No, no, that's an avoidance. In this scenario, you are condemned to life. So you're going to have to figure out how to cope no matter how awful. And, and in scripting, because the idea of a script is not only to provide the imaginal exposure, which is kind of like this terrible thing might happen, because a lot of times people are going, you know, if you say X might happen, it's like, I don't want to think about it. You know, as I said to you in the beginning of the show, you know, I can get any parent into immediate statement of denial by saying, so what if your kids die? And the response of almost every parent says, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to think it through. But if you're being tortured by the thought that that normal level of denial, which I don't think is the ideal way to handle it, but like you've already can't do it because you keep going into what about no? What about no? What about no? And so the very first step of a script is essentially saying, this, asking the question, why would I take this risk? You know, because then it, within that statement is part of your answer of why I'm going to pursue acceptance. It is not the same as acceptance, but it's why I'm being motivated to go after this, you know. None what would of us that want look to, like? How would you word that? As to why would I take this risk? I'm trying to think of how horrible to go. Well, um, let's pick an example because I think examples are helpful. So let's say someone yes. has relationship OCD and they're afraid they're making the wrong choice in their partner. And, you know, you picked one, I think, that not necessarily the most horribly devastating consequences yeah. on one hand compared to like, am I a child molester? We'll go there. However, <laughs> yeah. However, uh, and I have a really wonderful acceptance thing I do with that. So we will go there. But with, with the ROCD, you know, I, I want to know, am I making this terrible mistake with my spouse? And so what we're asking them to accept is never knowing. Mm -hmm. So you'd just you say know, that and, in the script? Well, uh, no, because, you know, we'll have talked to them and we'll talk about why, when am I will, you know, like, wh why am I willing to never know for sure? Because I think when somebody comes, you know, because some of it's like they're like taking a, looking at the relationship with the thermometer and taking the measure every minute, you know, like what's the temperature now, what's the temperature now? And, and, and there's this kind of fantasy that I should have no questions. I mean, depending on how deep they're in. I should find no one else attractive, but, you know, but every moment should be great and I should have no complaints. Well, I, that is a fantasy marriage, you know, Kathy and I took a trip to France and it was an incredible trip. And of course, when you say going to Paris, everybody's eyes glaze over. You know, we ate at a patisserie every morning, but let's face it, it's just a damn croissant, you know, <laughs> one place had the best cafe au lait, but we only ate there two days, but it was great. We saw the catacombs where we had to wait in line three hours in the hot sun. You know, went to a really fine restaurant, but we're not like super foodie, so we're not necessarily going to like it. The, the experience can't just depend on this was great food or this is terrible. We just spent a lot of money for what? We go in knowing that. And it was a great vacation, but a great vacation is not like every second is great. Yeah. Three hours in the hot sun. It's like, you know, yeah, five hour bus ride to go see this site, you know, but it was still a great vacation. And I think a relationship is like that. So I can't. Look at that. Now, I think for the person with ROCD, we're going to say, yeah, they are not perfect. You know, like any any relationship, we want like 100 things and we're only getting 70 of them. Should be more than 20, but we're only getting 70. Are you making a mistake? Now, most people with ROCD can say they don't want to leave right now. Outside, sometimes they want to leave because of the anxiety. It's like, then you have to stay. I don't want you talking about all your fears and confessing because if you are wrong you're just making this person feel bad for no reason you know so my my thought is you can leave this relationship when you know for like two weeks solid you want to leave with no question you know no question you know it as sure as is you know you're sitting there because they generally accept that we have to point out what are the realities of a relationship everyone on their wedding day thinks they're going to be married forever but, you know, that's wrong like 50% of the time. And whomever we marry, in, except my spouse being an exception, 
you know, 40 years later, they don't look as good as you did the day you married them. You know, technically, you were accepting second best in looks 40 years later, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, did you know the rates of divorce is higher in therapists? Wow. Then so, so, so Kathy and I are like really against the odds because <laughs> I mean, we started dating. This, this is a little scary to you. Probably we started dating in 1970 <laughs> and uh, this year it'll be our 50th anniversary. Wow. Congratulations. So been to get, you know, so we don't have much significant, you know, having met at the age of two and started dating, then we don't really have much significant history uh, before that. So, so, you know, and, and, and you will get angry and there, there, there are going to be things they don't want to do. And so, yes, you're, you're going to have to learn to live not knowing that. We also, so, so that's going to be part of the script that you don't get to know. And what if you're making a mistake? Well, even if you fell wildly happily in love now and you had no question, really nice feeling, you know, and, and if the relationship seems good, no reason to question it. Now, of course, if you have ROCD, you're checking all these reasons. So it's like you're not ready to leave yet. So, yes, when your answer to your questions is maybe. Because, right, even if I feel wonderfully in love with you, it might be that next year, after 20 years together, I discover you've been having a seven year illicit affair. I discover, oh, hey, guess what? You're leaving me. There are all kinds of things that could go wrong. Or I'll ask the person in this relationship, you know, if this relationship was good and you felt constant passion affair, and next year your spouse suddenly gets a dread disease that's going to make them really messed up and crippled and sick for the next years, I guess you're leaving them. And of course, everybody goes like, no. But the bottom line is, and that that's good, but that's not going to be like what you signed up for. So how do we make the best of it? I, I did this one thing with one couple that worked like magic. And I say, I'm saying that work like magic because I'd like to do it with everyone across the board, but usually it doesn't work like this. So this was like the, this was the, this was the low probability. Oh my God. This was like the killer intervention as opposed to this is a start for most people. I'd given the guy who, and it was such a cute couple, but I gave him the thing this weekend when you're spending time with her, I want you to notice Whenever you're having fun, and although part of you wants to compare it to what it should be, I want you to kind of consciously just notice whatever it is, like if it's 5%, because a lot of times you're comparing your current feeling to what it should be. And so there could be good things happening. You don't even notice because like, I was just thinking about this. I was just thinking about this. So he had that assignment to notice it, whatever. He came back. He was like, we had a great weekend. I still don't know how much I, and they, they could talk like this because she wasn't, I still don't know if I love her or not, but if it can be like this forever, I'm good. Now it doesn't, that, that, that was a rarity, but that was the beginning of acceptance for most people. Like just noticing, oh, I'm not miserable every second. And I agree a two minute, like 20% joy isn't like, oh, wow, that makes it all worth it. But it's stuff that you don't notice all along. We're trying to notice the good and the other stuff. And acceptance is not a decision. Learning, trying to learn it is. But when I talk about that couple who lost the two kids, when I say it was more than a year for them to get to acceptance, and, and, and what acceptance means for them, is they didn't compare every moment to what it would be like if their kids were still alive. Like I didn't know this at the time when I told them that everything goes well after a year, you'll still have a hole in your heart, but you'll stop comparing every moment to if they were still alive. They just listened. But the dad wrote a book about mourning and um, and he also did a one man show called grief, a one man shit show, which I wish I could show everyone. But in one of those places, he said that when I told them that, in his mind, he was saying, F you, I am never going to stop wishing my kids were alive. And then he wrote that two years later, he's come to realize it doesn't do him or his kids any good to wish they were alive. He said, except he still misses them greatly. He can still cry at them, but he's no longer making that comparison. And I'm mentioning because that takes time. No one expects a couple three weeks after their kids are murdered to be in acceptance. And 
the same with anything I have to accept. So the person with OCD, they have this goal, but getting to that great state where I'm, I'm living with this and it's okay, I embrace this life, is hard. Luckily, most of the time what they have to accept isn't devastating in the sense that nobody dies of AIDS, you know. Uh, am I with the wrong person forever? Well, maybe it's the second best life, but that's the life I'm asking you to live for now because all of us have no choice. Right. So let's let's break it down. So we're... Oh, and I'm sorry. No, no, you're great. <laughs> you're so good. I know. Okay. You're great. You're good I'm at being more... back on target. I'm a real visual person too. I don't know if you know that about mm. me. <laughs> like if I need to see it visually. So we've got this... By the way, that's fantastic because to say something and show it visually just makes it easier for everyone else around you that you're talking right. to. So I appreciate what you're going to do. Okay. So work, walk me through the visual here. So the first step is what? Why would you take this risk? Okay. What's the second? The second step is if I do X, here's a list of the things I'm actually scared might happen. Okay. I say actually scared because I want to go, what's their fear? I can always go beyond to even more horrible things but I need to know what is their actual worst fear. Right. You know, so really, to, so let's say num for two, if it was relationship OCD, it would be I am fi find out I'm in a terrible relationship and I'm stuck with them. Or if they were having harm obsessions, it would be I harm and kill my wife or my grandparent or so forth. So you would write that down. Here is what yes, I yes. would do. If this is, yeah, yeah, here's what might happen. Okay. What's step number three? Um, if this happens, how would I try to cope with this in a positive way? And that's key, isn't it? How would I cope in a positive way? <laughs> right, right. And, and that will often be second best. Mm, which is acceptance. Yeah. Well, it's the road to acceptance. Remember, acceptance is not just this logical thing. It's this emotional thing. And I, we can go, you know, I, I have clients and, you know, they appreciate it. It's like if we were just doing a therapy test, like say all the right stuff, they could ace therapy yeah. like right, right away. You know, right. they know how to say everything. They can do it. But feeling it takes time and behavior. I not only have to know it, I have to do the work of getting there. Mm. You know, so I have to go through all this pain. As I, I say, I think going through ERP is as painful as doing rituals. One is just an end of rituals versus endless rituals. And I hate to keep going back to this couple, but what I said initially, the only good thing about coping is it was better than not coping. Yeah. I yeah. had told them how well they were coping somewhere in the middle. And the, again, the dad said, wow, I hate to see the other poor bastards which was cute. And I said, yes, but you've been in support groups. You've seen them. Mm. And he suddenly realized, whoa, we, we are coping, even though this really sucks. So would you write in this script, I, I'm thinking through the lens of, and maybe I'm wrong here, please like tell me, like, I always think of the research around athletes. And when they have an injury, there's research to show that while they're in the hospital bed with their you know, new hip replacement and whatnot. The, the sports psychologists are coaching them through visual, imaginal imagery of them doing the layup again or and dunking the ball or turning the corner of the, the sprinting track or whatever. They're, they're doing that imagery work so, to sort of help them play out how they would cope, how they would handle the pain, how they would return. Is that what this process is in step three? Of no. Like, no? No. Well, that guy or woman who's, who's imagining that, does their injury permit that possibility? Tell me more. Yeah. Oh, are they so injured that they will never be able to do a layup? No. So in this example, probably don't. No, no. Right. But they, you know, or maybe the you know maybe somebody could say the odds are against them. So here's what you can try to do, and here's what to expect of how horrible it is to try. But you know, they might have to say you might not get there. Yeah. So in a marriage, 
I don't care how good the marriage is. I cannot say it will definitely work out. Yeah. I can't say you will definitely work out your problems. So I can't say you, you know, if I'm married for 20 great years and then we have these three years of hell and I find out that you've been cheating on me the last two years, did I make a mistake? Or, you know, or should I have left you four years ago except how would I know four years ago? And should I have not tried? And all these questions that don't have an answer. All I know is, you know, where I am now. And I feel like I like to say success is not making the right decision. It's coping with the consequences of whatever decision you have made. And I feel regret is cheating because regret is, I'm again, I'm, I'm going into denial as soon as I have a regret. I should have done X. X would have been different. I don't know if it would have been better. This fails. It doesn't mean X would, X being better is one possibility, but there are a whole lot of other ones where maybe it wouldn't have been as good. So all I can ever do is what is next? So that person in the relationship with ROCD, you know, what, have I, what do I need to do next? What have I learned? You know, and if somebody, somebody with ROCD did get divorced and gets into a relationship where they have the ROCD, but it's such a better relationship. It's not like you should have gotten out sooner. Because you know what? Maybe if you didn't go in that other relationship, maybe you wouldn't have been ready for this one. Maybe you needed to go through your ROCD yeah. and go through all the crap to have this good one. So dumping that person sooner and getting into another relationship might have been better, or maybe you would have picked worse. We don't get to know. All we know is what is from this moment on. So part of the exposure is, okay, X might happen. What are the possibilities of coping? And again, I, I think I said, you know, in, in my scenarios, a person can't do suicide. They're condemned to life. Because to say, why well, kill myself? That's just a way of not thinking in the present. Yep. I want you to be stuck thinking about how you would try to cope with this. And a lot of times people have been so distant from it that it just seems like, you know, it just seems like a screaming wall. It is kind of like getting a phone call that somebody you love died. The whole world stops. And that's where people stop thinking. But in the real world, something happens after you get that information. Yeah. So part of the exposure is to kind of go through what, what happened next? What are some possibilities? I always say to somebody, I don't know if I can cope with the worst things that could happen to me. But I know that there are brave people who have. I don't know if I can be like them, but they're a model that I hope I will do that. What if you don't cope? Well, then I'll be in deep trouble. My current plan is the best I can do is I hope I will cope. You know, I don't want to be main paralyzed and disfigured in a car crash. I hope I would cope. I don't have to know that I'd cope because I'm going to wait till I get there to try to find out. But I, I might try to imagine it. So we're going to imagine what would you actually do? You know, so in this relationship, how will I live never knowing? How will I live, you know, I'm taking the ROCD. How will I live, you know, what if, what if this is wrong? It's like, it might be wrong. What's kind of decent right now? What do you like? Because again, no person is perfect. You know, how do I get into the state of that? Do I ever send them people to marital counseling? If I see actual problems, I will, but I am not sending them to marital counseling to get rid of the ROCD. I'm sending them to get rid of actual problems. With or without those problems, they still have ROCD. Right. I'm just eliminating, okay, here's some definite reasons to get out. But once they're resolved, then you're still stuck with the ROCD. Yeah. So yeah. Is, is there a fourth step? Kind of. It's embedded in it, which is part of why I would take this risk is what's resulting from not taking this risk? Mm -hmm. What are the graphic, horrible things that keep happening to you because you keep avoiding? You know, including the torture you feel, the hours lost, humiliation from doing things. How are you actually hurting the people you think you love? Because a lot of times in ROCD, they can say they care about the person, you know. And, I, you know, I'll always ask somebody, you know, would you, you know, do you love your kids or love your spouse? And they'll say, yeah, will you do anything for them? And they'll say yes. And I'll say, I'm sorry, you're a liar. How do you hurt your family and loved ones with your OCD? Not being present, yelling at them because they didn't do something. 
you know, and all the other ways that one might asking for reassurance endlessly and being the pain in the neck. And I will point out, you have a choice in your relationship. And this is not only for ROCD, I'm going beyond ROCD, but you get, you know, you get to pick between, are you going to serve your fear or your love? You keep choosing fear over love. So part of it is part of acceptance is does have to do with what my values are. You know, who is the person I want to be? Here's another reason I need to do acceptance because here's life without acceptance. You know, like most of most people who we see, we can say, you know, the idea of trying to not accept and do avoidance. I think you've done an amazing experiment of checking out that method. I think the results are clear. It sucks. Yeah. So it's time to try this other method. Um, so, so it's like, why am I doing acceptance? Because like, I think, again, in our society, we just make acceptance sound so wonderful. But that's just an idea. Like, why would acceptance actually be worth it? So I have to think about why would it actually be worth it? I have to be motivated to do it. And then I'm stuck with this in-between thing that a lot of the time I'm doing this effort, recognizing I am not there yet. Right. Which, by the way, goes into this great, there's this great book, wonderful person wrote on self-compassion <laughs> because, because I need self-compassion during treatment because I'm not where I want to be. It's like, it's kind of like I'm doing this really hard work. And it's not there yet. And the best I get to say is, I'm working hard. I see some improvement. But yes, um, I'm not there yet. And mourning, learning to live the second best life takes time. Yeah, I keep saying second best life. I don't actually mean it in some sense. But that is the feeling that when I'm working towards acceptance that it is. And I think in some cases, it's not really a second best life. I think a lot of times if I overcome a fear, it's like, this is great. Other times it is. I've had some people with like a moral OCD about something they've done in the past. And they're going through all these contortions to try to convince themselves that it's not really bad, even though they actually think it's bad, but maybe here's why it's not bad. And part of the acceptance is, oh yeah, that was a bad shitty thing. Yes, you feel guilty about that. What is forgiving yourself mean? And shockingly, almost nobody knows what forgiving yourself means. And how are you going to get to that point? But I have to accept, yeah, that was bad. Yep, that hurt people. Or that was, you know, whatever it is, by whatever standards, you know, like, and again, depending who we're talking about, it's like, oh, I guess we have to have you accept being as bad as everyone else. Yeah. And in some other cases, like, no, that was really bad. Yeah. And it's great. The last, the last sort of part of the question is like, what's the result of not taking this risk or even not accepting this, which is you have additional pain, right? It's the pain just keeps going and going and going. Right, right. It's okay. right. End of pain, endless pain. Yeah. So if they've used these somewhat prompts and people can go to your book and work through a lot of them. I know on your website, there are a lot of worksheets as well. Once they're writing these prompts, is there anything else you feel is important for them to know about this process or to be aware of or be prepared for in this process? I am pausing, you know, the next being the next revision of the book, you know, might be your inspiration. Well, because I know that it is way, 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 way easier said than done. You know, it's kind of like, the core treatment for all OCD is the same. However, I have a completely different set of things I say depending on the presentation. Because they kind of each have their own set of things that the individual has to be focused on working to, to accept and live with. And although I think in my book, I attempt when I talk about each presentation, I do, I do try to go over those. And, uh, you know, I've seen that for many people as helpful, but I also see for many people who've read the book, and even though they've kind of read it, it ends up different for them to actually have to discuss it out loud. Sometimes it's because they haven't been able to think about it. Sometimes without realizing it, they avoid thinking about it. And sometimes because I think not all the connections are obvious. 
which I know is a really big statement. So I think I'll have to have, I, I can go on, but I'm going to wait for you to ask a question. It's interesting because, as you know, we just got a new puppy. It's taking over all of the Quinlan family um, and our life. And I had a moment where I was, my, our top puppy loves his belly to be, to be scratched. And right there is his genitals, right? Mm-hmm. And you have, I, I can see the projection of my mind of like, what if you just touched that? Or what if you pulled that back? Or what if you, you know, and the imagery, I could see myself doing it. I could see it was, I was, and thankfully I have all these skills where I'm able to go, oh, there's a thought or there's, or there's, you know, right. and I could feel that sort of hot, sticky anxiety yeah. flow going right. through. It's a, if you don't change diapers regularly, I'm sorry, it's a weird experience, and I don't care who you are, you're going to think about that. You know, if, I, if, if you're changing a little person, and like, there you are, you're rubbing their genitals because you got to clean it up and wipe it, and like, you know what you're doing, and you're just, yeah. and, and they, the healthy thing is like, okay, weird thoughts, and like, yeah, this is normal. Yeah. You know, if I have OCD, it's like, why would I even think that? Yeah. Well, it's normal. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's funny because I was noticing myself going through some of these sort of imaginal scripting steps myself, like instead of going, no, 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 you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you couldn't, that's terrible. It was like, all right. And and there was that, this is, this is the last question I want, because you've given some great examples is as I was having this thought, I noticed the choice. I use the word choice on purpose to get really edgy with it and try not to have it. And my body language is all tight. And I was uh, gritting my teeth or I was like, Kimberly, just let it flow. Like let the thoughts come or also. So as you're doing this with your patients, is there any piece of you where you're bringing their attention to whether their shoulders are all tight and their jaw is all tight and their Mm -hmm. hands are all tight or does that not matter? Nothing not matters, maybe, but that's not always true. Um, I, I think. I, I think. It, I, I thought you'd enjoy that. I think. I think it depends on how much that's part of their conscious yeah. fear response. You know. I mean, I think if they're doing their dog, and and you know, it's like, oh my god, am I excited by this? And it's like, the answer I would be working on is, I'm not really sure. Maybe I'm in some deep way. I'm not going to play with the genitals now. And that's the best I get to know. Yeah. You Agreed. Know? Agreed. All right. I love this. Thank you. We, I feel like this, again, I want you to sort of say where are the resources that people can go to get your concrete sort of workbooks and your worksheets. I love how you make me have so many more books and worksheets. Uh, all the, and, and all the paperwork that appears in my book appears for free for anybody on the site, freedomfromocd.com. That they wouldn't, you know, in the Kindle and audio version, most people, you know, they, they couldn't have those. So obsessed with the Kindle version. So I, I, you know, made that available. And my book has most of my repertoire, except about 20 minutes. And, and those are the main places. And, and, and I hate to do this, but You know, most of the time when it comes to OCD books, I will say to people, there are a bunch of books that I would recommend, you know, I think that are roughly equal. And I, but I think, you know, one that most agrees with me, you know, happens to be mine. Um, So so I kind of mentioned a few of the other good books. Uh, There is only one other book that seriously that I tell people to get because I think it's different. And that is your book, which, which is, uh, it it is amazing because I generally, I hate books that label themselves self-compassion because it's like it's it's because it's just kind of a version of like you know be nice to yourself in a lot of words i feel your your book gives these not easy to do steps that make it like work although as i said to you last time it is true you use too many exclamation points (laughs) no i will forever decline your opinion on my exclamation points (laughs) And my emojis. If you know, if you ever text with me, you'll know that I over emoji and I over exclamation point. <laughs> I'm okay with that in text. 
<laughs> Thank you for that wonderful compliment. And I do agree. Yes, I have been I have been blamed for the exclamation mark issue before, but I stand up and I stand with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to war- I like to warn people because, you know, I want them to know, oh, no, don't worry. This isn't, as you would put it, all flowers and unicorns. It's a great book with too many exclamation points. No. It's funny because my mom helped me edit it while I was in a 14-day quarantine in a hotel, in a Sydney hotel for COVID. And she would go through and she would add exclamation marks. She would be like adding, (laughs) she was like adding emojis and hearts and smiley faces. And I was like, oh, we are going crazy here. (laughs) Yeah. So now I know where you got it from. (laughs) We're all love. We're all love. Um, And thank you for that. It's a very huge compliment. Thank you so much for being here and talking about this again. I love having you on talking just a little deeper into the topic and and a bit more abstract, which I think is helpful too. Is there anything else you want to conclude on here? I would love to have some really cool, all summarizing conclusion. The truth is, you know, I can just talk endlessly. So I'm just going to thank you for having me on and I am always willing to come talk with you. Yeah. You know, I would say you're, the point that I love that you made today, which I will add for you, is the word and. Yes, it's, I've been really... The word and is so important in this conversation. That's a great summary because it's, it's, I think so many of our ideas, it's not like they're new. They kind of get refined with time and so... In a way, something we've been saying all along, and suddenly, like, there's this additional, slight, very slightly different way of saying it. But, but it's such a, it, it summarizes it in a way that makes it more understandable, and, and, I think does that for a lot of, for a lot of understanding, mindfulness, and acceptance. Yeah, thank you so much. You take care. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.